there's a magic that happens when you're responsible for somebody learning something for the first time, and, and that results in tremendous feelings of self-esteem. It's wonderful for everybody involved. I mean, here we have our own students teaching our younger students, and it's a role model to look up to. So I think, you know, if we're creative, we can find ways to tap into the ways that students can show us their best learning. Students bring diverse and interesting stories with them, and my teaching methods allow a space for them to have voice and to improve and deepen the education of everybody in the room. One more thing that really moved me about it was the way the students really came together. Booth peeked through the dot of light on the door. The seating arrangement in the box was perfect for an assassin. Lincoln sat at the far left, nearly against the wall of the box. Lincoln was close to the door which Booth would spring, outstage. It was the beginning of Act 3, Scene, stew, scene 2, on stage. At 10.11 p.m., Booth plunged both his hands into his deep, copious pockets of his black frock coat and withdrew his weapons. In his right hand was a .44 caliber single-shot Derringer pistol, in his left the sharp and shiny Rio Grande camp knife. Booth steadied himself and listened keenly to the dialogue of the play for his cue. Booth's thumb pulled back the hammer of the derringer until he heard it cock into firing position. His hand dropped to the porcelain doorknob. Booth stepped toward Lincoln and focused his eyes on the back of the president's head. He raised his right arm to shoulder height and extended it forward, aiming the pistol at Lincoln's head. Until Booth increased his finger pressure to a few pounds, the derringer would not fire. He squeezed harder. The audience exploded into laughter. The last possible moment before the pistol discharged, Abraham Lincoln jerked his head away from Booth, low to the left, as though trying to evade the shot. Black powder charge exploded and spit the bullet towards Lincoln's head, which illuminated the box like a lightning bolt. Lincoln's wet brain matter slowed the ball's velocity, absorbing enough of its energy to prevent it from penetrating the other side of Lincoln's skull and exiting through the president's face. The ball came to rest in Lincoln's brain, lodged between his right eye. Lincoln could not react fast enough and never knew what had happened to him. His chin hit his chest. Lincoln, Lincoln's body lost all muscular control. Lincoln lost consciousness before he heard the report of the pistol, smelled the gunpowder, or was even enveloped by the smoke. The sound of the pistol sounding like the poof of fireworks, a characteristic of the 19th century black powder weapons with low muzzle velocities. The pistol startled a number of members of the audience. Some people even thought it was the part of the play. Lincoln jumped from the stage and claimed, Six Sever Tyrannus! Thus always to the tyrants, the South is avenged. Dr. Charles Lee witnessed Booth's sleep. I saw a man with dark hair and bright black eyes sleep from the box to the stage below, and he raised a shining dagger in the air which reflected the light as though it had been a diamond. Harry Hawk, actor on stage, could not understand what was happening. Booth fled into the wings of the stage right, slashing his dagger wildly at anyone, orchestra, conductor, actor, or employee who got in the way. William Withers felt Booth's hot breath as the assassin pushed past him and struck at him with his knife. No one tried to stop Booth in fear of being injured. A voice cried, Stop that man! No one had done a thing. The manhunt for Booth almost ended before it began when an army lawyer and mayor named Joseph Stewart rose from his seat to pursue the assassin. Booth continued rushing through the wings and down the passageway leading to the back door that opened to Baptist Alley. The manhunt for Booth almost ended before it began when one man named Joseph B. Stewart had done this.
Stewart slipped before he can make his leap at Booth. At this moment, as Booth reached for the back door, interceptors might be running on 10th, then right away on F to cut him off, to cut him off at the mouth of F in Baptist Alley. Someone might have mounted a horse to chase him down already. Danger lay behind Booth as Stewart was following him into the wings and down the passageway and shortening his distance. Booth prayed that Ned Spangler had held his horse. If he had tried to... If he, had, if he had tired of holding the animal or taking it back to the actor's stable, Booth was doomed. Booth lunged over the horse. With brute force, Booth yanked himself onto the back black-legged bay mare with a white star on her forehead and grabbed the reins. Booth, clutching his dagger, stained with Major Rathbone's blood, kicked Peanut in the head and popped him in the head with the dagger. Booth started to gallop away as Stewart noticed it. Booth was an experienced rider. Booth broke free from Stewart, and the horse exploded into a gallop that guided toward F Street, vanishing from sight. He had come out of the theater door so quick that it seemed like like as if he had touched the horse and it was gone in a flash of lightning, Marianne Turner recounted. F Street was coming up fast for Booth as he looked down the alley's mouth. Booth wondered if his pursuers had reached him before him. He merged onto F Street and reined his mount hard to the right. No one was chasing after Booth, and he galloped down F Street. He had barely escaped from Ford's Theater. He was trying to escape from Washington, but the streets were crowded with thousands of soldiers and loyal citizens to the Union. A block down F and to his right, but Booth rode past Herndon House. Booth continued another block and approached two of Washington's greatest landmarks, the Payton Passion Office and the left in Lincoln's Ball. Few people saw Booth as he fled down Washington. Sergeant Silas T. Cobb was standing watch at the Washington side of Bridgehead. Cobb, Cobb knew to allow no one to cross the bridge after dark. Booth crossed the bridge between 10.35 and 10.45 p.m. Booth acted as if he was a friend and explained, I'm going down home, down into Charles County. Cobb allowed Booth to pass. Booth was lucky at this point. He had crossed the river into Maryland. He had to cross the bridge or he would be a suspect. John Wilkes Booth was riding 10 miles south from Washington. The assassination threw Washington into chaos. Booth and Harold didn't encounter any soldiers as they pressed on. Booth could ride past Union Cavalry. Not a soul in Maryland knew that Abraham Lincoln had been shot. Booth stopped at Surratt Tavern around midnight to retrieve weapons and supplies which had been hidden. Mary Surratt would become convicted of conspiracy to assassinate the president. On July 7, 1865, Mary became the first woman to be executed by the United States government. David knocked on the tavern door, which awoke the tavern keeper, John M. Lloyd, who rented the tavern for Mary Surratt. Harold called on Lloyd to make haste and get those things. Lloyd knew what Davy meant. Davy was visited by Surratt and was informed that a party would call for two rifles that were hidden at the tavern. While Lloyd collected the items, Davy entered the tavern and got whiskey, which was shared by Booth. Booth announced to John Lloyd, We have assassinated the president and Secretary Stewart. Lloyd was dumbfounded by the news. The pair are armed and ride away in search of a doctor to treat Booth's broken leg. Dr. Mudd set Booth's broken leg on the front parlor sofa on the morning after the assassination. Booth was moved into an upstairs bedroom so that he could splint Booth's broken leg. Mudd cut off Booth's riding boot up and down and fastened the splint around the leg. Mudd got a bandbox, also known as thin wood, to cut the boot. Splints were wrapped in figure eight patterns. Booth rest upstairs. Booth remained in bed and Davy inquired with Mudd about getting a wagon to convey his injured friend. Davy went into Bryantown to look for a wagon, and Mudd would do some shopping for his wife. Davy observed federal troops and hightailed back to Dr. Mudd's house. Mudd was told about the assassination of Lincoln and heard the police were looking for two fugitives in Bryantown. When Mudd returned home, the two assassins had continued their escape and were on their way to cross the Sakaya Swamp with the help of a guide and would be on their way to Rich Hill, home of Colonel Cox. Mudd was interrogated by authorities and initially claimed that he never met Booth before setting his broken leg. He was placed on a trial as a co-conspirator in the assassination of President Lincoln. A jury found him guilty and sentenced him to life in prison at Port Jefferson in Dry Tortugas, Florida, a military fort 70 miles off the coast of Key West. John Wilkes Booth arrived at Rich Hill during the wee hours of April 16, 1865. The reputation of Colonel Cox was an ardent South sympathizer who led Booth to the door. The thoughts were not known of what were racing through Cox's head when he was face to face with the assassin at the doorstep. He decided to assist the man in some way, being a colonel. Cox allowed 
John Wilkes Booth and David Harold to enter his home for a meal, but then sent them into a nearby pine thicket to be cared for by his foster brother, Thomas Jones. Cox ordered his overseer, Franklin Roby, to hide Booth and Harold in a spot in a nearby pine thicket. Cox was informed upon by Oswald Swan, the man who unwittingly guided the fugitives to Rich Hill. After Swan reported taking a man with a broken leg across the swamp, the authorities arrived at Rich Hill on April 24th to make arrests. Colonel Cox was held at Bryan Town Tavern, where he was interrogated by Colonel Henry Wells. Cox claimed to not know of the man's identities and was imprisoned in Washington. For about four and a half days, John Wilkes Booth and Harold hid from federal troops in the southern Maryland woods. There was nothing much in the woods where Booth and Harold hid. Booth wore dark clothing and denim color that allowed him to hide well in the woods. He had his pocket watch, knife, two pistols, and his diary, or pays de raisons, French for Booth's diary. Booth knew that no one was coming or not knowing when they would come. Thomas Jones brought Booth coffee, whiskey, fish, ham, and bread. Booth felt like a prisoner in the woods and had Harold with him. Harold went to many lanes to stick by his assassin. It was hard for Booth to walk with crutches. His left leg was broken and his right hand held a gun. He used his blanket to keep himself warm at nights, but oftentimes it was hard for him to roll over due to the splint on his leg. On the night of April 20th, 1865, Jones brought Booth and Harold to a boat on the bank of the Potomac and directed them to the Virginian shore. However, Booth and Harold did not greet the morning sun of April 21st on Virginian land. Rather, they found themselves making landfall in Maryland, further away from their intended destination. Booth and Harold arrived northwest from their departure point and landed in Nanjamoy Creek. After Booth and Harold left Thomas Jones and ventured into the, into the Potomac, something stirred the men off their course. Thomas Jones attributed to the flood and unfriendly currents as to the reason why Booth and Harold did not keep their course. Booth wrote in his diary, After being hunted like a dog through swamps, woods, and being chased by gunboats till I was forced to return wet cold and staring with everyone's hand turned against me, I am in despair. Booth and Harold discovered a house nearby where Harold made his way. The latter saw something familiar about the place, he knowing all that country well. The pair armed the pair arrived at land called Indian Town Farm, and it was attended it was tended by Davis' son in law, John J. Hughes, who lived on the property with his family. Booth and Harold spent thirty six hours on Indian Town property. Davy Harold was arrested at Garrett Farm. John Hughes provided no aid to the fugitives at all. Hughes refused to give them bread and water. It was the residence of Colonel John J. Hughes near Nanjami Shores in Maryland, directly west of Pope's Creek, about eight or nine miles. The Potomac is so wide and has so many broad inlets that in the darkness of the Virginia shore and the Maryland shore seemed the same. Harold went up to the house and asked for food and said that Booth was in the marsh nearby where they had pulled up the boat out of observation. The good man of the house was much disturbed but gave Harold food. The keeper of the house at Nanjame became frightened after they left and told his lawyer of the circumstances who took him after at once before a federal officer. Saturday, April 22nd, 1865. In the early morning, Booth and Harold touched down in Gambo Creek, Virginia. While Booth is thrilled to be in Virginia, they are still in the wrong place. They were trying to get to Matradoc Creek in Miss Queenberry's place. Fortunately, the large farm is only a mile southwest. Harold hikes it as Booth waits by the boat. Miss Queenberry has been expecting the fugitives. She sends Thomas Horbin, a Confederate agent. Together, they all go back to Gambo Creek and ride eight miles to Dr. Richard Stewart's house. Stewart's, Stewart gives them food and whiskey, but refuses to treat Booth. He directs him to the cabin of a free African-American couple, William Lucas and his wife. Booth and Harold arrive around midnight on the 24th. They force Lucas and his wife from their own home at Knife Point. The next morning, Lucas' son, Charlie, drives them 10 miles to Port Charles, where they meet up with Confederate soldier William Jett. He takes them to, pay, to the Peyton house. They venture on to Richard Garrett's farm about three and a half miles away. Booth convinces the family that him and Harold are cousins and that he is a wounded Confederate soldier in need of shelter. Booth sleeps at Garrett farm and sleeps late into the morning, tired from his journey. The Garretts are suspicious and question Booth. 
At around 2.30 a.m. the following night, the 16th New York Cavalry surrounds the barn. David Harold immediately surrenders, but not Booth, which makes him more of a radical and crazy person. The cavalry set the barn on fire, smoking Booth out as he tries to escape and is shot in the neck. Fit at 7.15 a.m. on April 26, 1865, the following morning, Booth dies and Harold is hung thereafter. It is crazy to, to know that Booth tried to escape after he was shot, before he was shot in the neck, after the barn was set on fire. It shows how radical he is as, as a Confederate and how crazy he had been as an assassin, and that he didn't want to let his guard down and didn't want to continue his journey. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Waltis entered the rear bedroom of the Peterson house soon after Lincoln arrived and noticed that the president lay extended on a bed, breathing heavily. The doctors explained that Lincoln could not recover. In his diary, Wallace wrote, The giant sufferer lay extended diagonally across the bed, which was long enough for him. He had been stripped of his clothes. His slow, full respiration lifted the clothes within each breath he took. His features were calm and striking. I had never seen them appear to better advantage than for the first hour, perhaps, that I was there.